we always start with the team and that has been the case for all the types of investments i think whether it's it vc or private equity even team is the core thing mm. however that's where similarities end and the next thing we do at rpv is we do deep technical due diligence sometimes it's like 20 pages long document we employ external scientists usually those would be the chairs of their specific departments or we even talked once to a Nobel Prize winner about that. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Seed to Harvest. I'm here with my friend Arkady, and today we're going to be talking a bit about engineering and venture. So I'm really excited for today's episode. If you're new here, this podcast, Seed to Harvest, is hosted by me, Paige Van Doherty. I'm the founding partner behind Genius Ventures, and I interview founders, creators, and investors, and just try and have conversations about the stories, tactics, and frameworks that they've found helpful in the mishaps that happen along the way. So, Arkady, do you want to introduce yourself briefly to give the audience some context on who you are? Sure. Hi, my name is Arkady, and I am a founding partner at RPV. We're a physics-enabled deep tech firm. We focus on pre-seed ventures with some really nice signs as a foundation of them. Awesome. And I'm, I guess I'm curious, this is what, like, one of the questions that I like to ask is, how did you get into venture? How did you find it? The quest started with science more than venture itself. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for all the different ways I can contribute to science. I've made my money in IT and I was like, it's all cool and, and nice, and sure, technology. And I always had that urge to get something, get a little closer to some really hard problems, you know, whether it's neuroscience or photonics or energy or materials. I had this urge in me, probably inspired by science fiction, too, too much science fiction read as a kid and definitely inspired by physics education. I've got master's in physics. And to me, the, the scientific breakthrough itself, the theory or you know, mathematical equations, they have their own aesthetics to them, sure. At the same time, the full value of science is only realized when we productize it and when people get some benefits out of it, mm. whether it's better energy source, you know, better health, or whatever the benefits could be. Yeah, which is interesting because you come from a physics background. And so it, it sounds like the thing that resonates with you really strongly is actually the application of science versus the pure theoretical. Yes, I think that, that we should follow the value chain to the end, right? The mm -hmm. purely theoretical things have their own beauty. Experiments have their own drive. When you know, you try, you fail, you try, you fail, and finally it works. All of the steps and process have something to be excited about. At the same t time, I, I'm trying to look at the whole picture. And if everybody, like if people don't benefit from this scientific breakthrough, then honestly, the only people who are winning are scientists and their egos. Like, you know, I've invented <laughs> something. Okay, cool. Sure. Good for you. Yeah. How do we make it accessible for everybody else? I love that. Yeah, the, like democratization of access to scientific mm -hmm. breakthroughs. I'd love to hear more about maybe some of the specific like hard problems that you're thinking through or have back that are really exciting to you right now. Well, I think neuroscience would be number one on my list. Sure, there are things like photonics. We can talk about it later. The reason I mentioned neuroscience um, is... What is, sorry, what is photonics? <laughs> I was never afraid um, to ask the dumb questions in my engineering classes, and I'm sure as heck not now. <laughs> simply put, photonics, like electronics, is when yeah. you're, all of your computing machine, they work on electrons moving mm -hmm. physically within your circuits. Photonics is the same where instead of electrons, you use photons. Mm -hmm. So photons do not have a mass, so they're much easier to manipulate. On average, we expect that the photonic chip would would use a thousand times less energy, not a thousand percent, a thousand times less energy than electronics. And uh, it's it's going to be a cool breakthrough again. But Yeah, that'll be massive, especially with like AI and all of the energy yeah. constraints that are happening right now. Cool. From what I've heard, you know, an AI query is around a thousand times more energy consuming than a traditional search query. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I've never seen any hard data. I've heard some rumors about that. So take it with a grain of salt, okay? And then photonics can actually change it. But the best example that I've heard is when people compare photonics to light bulbs, mm -hmm. how many incandescent light bulbs do you have instead of LED light bulbs in your house or your office? 
This is a pop quiz. And like <laughs> 10 years ago, 10 years ago, it, it was only yeah. that it was no LED lamps whatsoever. Now it's mm. all LED. The same mm. stuff will happen with photonics and electronics. This is one of those silent revolutions that you and I won't even really notice because major benef beneficiaries would be data centers and, and these big, big compute companies. Neuroscience would be way more noticeable. Yeah, tell but, me more about the neuroscience. Yeah, there is a two-fold problem the way I see it. Side, on both sides of the spectrum, actually. So on one hand, we have a rapidly aging population in the Western world, Europe, US, all of these countries, uh, Japan, China as well. So pretty much the whole world is rapidly aging. And with all the advancements in healthcare, in longevity, it will only become worse. And all the neurodegenerative uh, diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and you know, you name it, there, there is a whole long list. Dementia is a horrible one. This will be more and more prevalent. That's the older population. The younger population, Gen Zs and Gen Alpha, especially, from everything we see, from everything we hear, the mental health would be a huge issue, much, much bigger than it was in the, the millennials, for example. The, the whole climate change, the whole social unrest, the, the, the fact that Oh, and the access to all the information about it as well. Because I feel like in generations yes. past, it was like in academic papers. And mm -hmm. if you were in that niche or interested in it, you would know about it. But now it's we have all that access to information at our fingertips and on our feeds and in TikTok algorithms. And then it's emotionally charged. So people share it even more. So algorithms mm -hmm. pick it up on, on that even more. So we have aging population with neuro neurodegenerative diseases. We've got Young population with mental health issues, both of them can benefit a lot from neuroscience. Mm -hmm. We backed a couple of companies that are focusing on non-invasive, non-chemical ways to treat your brain. Mm -hmm. It's called neuromodulation. Uh, wow. We are under very heavy NDAs. I cannot go into more specifics than that. I can say only one thing, that one of them is treating an anxiety with 86% efficacy in preclinical trials. Dang. Just for comparison. Yeah. Placebo is 30%. Best of class peels is like 40, 45. So it's, a, it's an increase. And these guys are 86. And it's a non-toxic thing. So there are no side effects. No toxicity, no, no damage to your whole organism. So these guys are going to rock it. And another company is focusing on reducing inflammation in cells, especially mm -hmm. in brain cells. And this is the way to cure all the neurodegenerative things. So we're trying to handle as much as we can, both mental issues and, you know, aging issues. Mm. And and I guess I'm, I'm curious to understand as a pre-seed investor, specifically in deep tech, how do you think about, I think you have a really interesting diligence model. So how do you, how do you think about evaluating companies when, you know, they're very early in their research phases or company building phases? How do you think about that and picking the ones that you think will have massive impact in the future? We always start with the team, and that has been the case for all the types of investments, I think, whether it's IT, VC, or private equity even. Team is the core thing. Mm -hmm. However, that's where similarities end. And the next thing we do at RPV is we do deep technical due diligence. Sometimes it's like 20 pages long document. We employ external scientists. Usually those would be the chairs of their specific departments or we even talked once to a Nobel Prize winner about that. Not that it was a lot of help, but sometimes, <laughs> like, seriously, the, these guys. I was supposed to be like, you know, whoa. And then you're like, not that but, they were that much help. <laughs> no, it's, it's like they, they have this beautiful understanding that they're a beautiful mind and like they, they see the picture at a you know, 10,000 feet view, but we need a picture at a microscopic level. We need to understand yeah. specific details you need a of an numerical model. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We want to know how this specific type of glue in this advanced material will affect the properties of that material. We don't need a lecture on history of materials and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so we employ external scientists. We go in depth. We, we do it in several iterations. We have a whole process. I can share it with you if you want to add it as a graphics later. We have a oh, whole yeah. process, how it's done, what kind of questions we ask. I can show you some examples. We verify every equation. You would be surprised how many times we've seen mistakes in, in just applying the right equations to the specific problem. Not going to share examples from that. Mm -hmm. We verify, I mean, I don't want to do that, right? We redo every calculation 
even sometimes even those things have mistakes in them. So we basically run the proper peer review, but instead of a scientific article, we do it for a, for the materials that the company for, provides. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's like a peer reviewed due diligence process, which I think is really cool really? and very unique for many of the firms that I've talked to. I, I guess I'd be curious to understand what, you know, as, as you've continued investing, what patterns have arisen from the companies or founders that you've invested in? Are there any like specific traits that you really key in on or you think make a really talented technical founder? The only pattern that I am ready to identify right now has less to do with deep tech and more to do mm -hmm. with entrepreneurship in general. However smart or emotionally intelligent or good in sales or good in culture that the founders might be, the biggest indicator of their success would be their resilience and their mm. ability to just keep on going. Not, not doing the same thing, not just being stubborn and doing the same stuff, but be right. resilient and finding the new path to achieve your goal. In terms yeah, of I think, transport, mm -hmm, go ahead. I was going to say, I think about that as like execution velocity. So it's like, how quickly can you execute? And then how, mm -hmm. like, how thoughtfully can you shift your direction when you're doing that? Mm -hmm. I guess I'd be curious to understand one of the things I've been thinking about is like risk tolerance. And I would say I put myself like pretty high on the scale of like risk tolerant. I'm curious if you've seen any like patterns with that specifically among the entrepreneurs you back. Not within our entrepreneurs. I think the risk tolerance on its own is not necessarily a good predictor, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Their ability to identify risks and mitigate them early on. Mm. So instead of enduring risks, they don't like risks so much. that They try to find the ways to minimize that in every single opportunity. Mm. Uh, so this usually brings more success than, than, you know, enduring risk. Because if... Again, that's my opinion, right? Yeah. If, if you can endure a lot of risk at some point, the, the, pr the amount of parameters in the system grows so much that people stop losing grasp of that, that they really don't understand it anymore. So if they can reduce the risk here on the technical side, here on the team side, and maybe get an LOI from a potential big client. So reducing risk is a very important thing. I would mm -hmm. say more important than ability to endure it. Yeah, and just pick like the big you know, the handful of big ones, but the ability lies in the ability or the ability is to identify which ones you're not going to take and then minimize the risk of those happening in the future. Exactly. Huh, that's the magic is, of course, is, is identifying which ones are important. That's where yeah. a lot of people do a lot of mistakes. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I, and then I guess like what was what made you make your first investment that you ever made? What was that like? Walk me through that. The very first investment was the one that was extremely important for us for many reasons, right? We were testing our process. We we're making sure that our LPs would see it in the right way. So there were multi, it was a multi-factor decision. Things that really stood out were the team. This particular team was a perfect match of a strong scientist and a strong entrepreneur who already has created something in the neuroscience field. So one of the founders already had a successful neuroscience company before, and mm -hmm. another one spent around 12 years of his life in this specific area of research. So I think this is the best match, and they had a very good dynamic within that team. So that really solved us. The problem they were trying to fix, and still are successfully fixing now in clinical now, not in preclinical. So this was... The, as I said, the mental health issues, I think it's very important to find the way to heal it without toxicity and annual courses and things like that. This was also a big one. Of course, the, this problem translates into a market and the culture and philosophy of the company was extremely important to us. The way they mm. saw the world, the way they, they ultimately want to build a device that anybody can use at home without any mm. doctor supervision. And they're their focus on the, what they call 3P, profit planet people, their focus on all of these things together and not just, you know, making a shit ton of cash. Excuse my French. This, this is very important. The, the, the approach and culture was also important. I would say those three major factors. And of course, scientific due diligence. Yeah, we did that. But this goes 
with every company. And sometimes we right, pass right. On, on those who have a good science, but don't have a strong factors on other sides of things. Mm. That's super cool. When, when you talk about the vision and the long-term view of the company being really important, how do you think about RPV from that perspective? The whole idea and the whole vision behind RPV was always bridging the gap in this value chain that we've started the discussion with, right? In making sure that the scientific theory is translated into robust technology, translated into an accessible product. So to me, RPV is just a vehicle to make sure that truly breakthrough science finds its way into the real life. The, the way I think about the firm is that while we will be maybe changing technologies like photonics, for example, probably mm -hmm. would be not as interesting in say seven to 10 years from now, it's going to be a mature technology. There would be no way to invest in that in pre-seed stages. There will be other areas that would arise. I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of breakthroughs on the intersection of biology and physics. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily synthetic biology, that's already happening, but some, some new fields that we don't know yet. We will always be trying to fix the funding gaps that exist in the industries. So the one that we found right now is this pre-seed stage when they have a strong science, strong technology, but not necessarily productized yet, productized it yet. Yeah. This is my, my vision of the, this is the, the short term, the, the, the short description of a vision of our firm to maximize the potential of science becoming a real product. I love that. I get one, th one thing I was talking about with my executive coach yesterday was as a, as an entrepreneur, as, as you are like running RPV. You kind of have this, you have what I would say is a rhythm and a melody. So like a rhythm might be like annual filings, quarterly financials, investor updates, you know, check-ins with your founders. And then your melody is like everything else on top of that that makes you special as a firm that's really hard to like put to a specific like timeline or cadence. And I think that I, I'd be curious to understand like from that framework, what, what do you think of are like aspects of your unique melody as a firm because I feel like a lot of firms have like pretty similar rhythms like you know we all have SEC <laughs> regulations rhythms, and things like that yeah, yeah. they're dictated by the market and, yeah um, yeah exactly traditional expectations I think the melody of our firm would be science at the core of everything we do whether it's the scientific due diligence or an investment process or a scorecard that we use, or even the, the way we look at building our deck for our LPs, it is always, okay, we have a hypothesis that this is going to work in a specific mm. manner. Let's test it. Did it work? Good. If it didn't, how do we change it? And what would be the new updated hypothesis? I honestly believe that scientific method is the biggest invention after fire. So we had fire, so we can extend the day, but then we had scientific methods, so we can completely change the way we perceive the world. The, the humanity lived in the dogmatized world, you know? You have a book, everything is written in this book, go to a priest, get your answer. And then yeah. scientific method appeared, and we started questioning everything, doubting everything, and we finally had a framework to start questioning it in a robust manner. So our malady would be the scientific method. Our flavor of the melody, I hear it very often from the founders and LPs, is that we, we are not trying to sell anything to anybody. We're not trying to push anything to anybody. We are very calm and as a matter of fact, you know, let's yeah. just get it done. This is our story. If you want to be a part of it, join us. If you don't want to be a part of it, there are so many other opportunities around. You can go and find it. That, that would be the melody and its flavor. I love that. It, yeah, does I think it answer you're like, your question? Yeah, definitely. I think you're one of the things that struck me when we initially talked was that you are like very calm and thoughtful and like very anchored by the scientific method, which I think is really awesome because I feel like that was something I, I, I would say I think about it a lot from like the entrepreneur th entrepreneurship methodology of like the lean startup. And so it's it's more of mm -hmm. like the scientific method applied to business. And that's how I've thought about you know, whatever it is, whether that's making a new piece of content, putting out a new series, like making, I would say less on the investment side, I think more on like the firm building side. But 
I think it's been a really interesting like undercurrent or like pr principle to think about. Do you have any questions for me? What is the melody of your firm? That's such a lovely question. Like we've started before we started recording talking about musical instruments. And you mentioned that that piano is on your to-do list and the way you want to learn how to do it. So what would be the melody and flavor of your firm page? Yeah, I mean, I think the melody of our firm, you know, the rhythm is operational excellence. I, I think I came into venture and I wanted to make sure that I got at like building a firm from a first principles standpoint. I wasn't going to adhere to rules that I didn't think were like backed by first principles, but I'm like, okay, we're, an, you know, we're an audited venture fund and we work with world-class service providers on like legal tax, fund admin, et cetera. Uh, but on the melody side, because we're grounded in those first principles, I think the threads that really connect that are like community and content. And, you know, I'm a, I like to joke, I'm like an adolescent of the internet. I grew up in the, in the day and age where I was still spending like all my days outside. And then when I was in middle school, I got my first computer and we had dial up internet and I had to like wait for my parents to finish using the computer before I could call my friends. Like, it was very much in that transition period. And I think that for me, like being on the internet was just magic and the ability of like storytelling and connection that I was able to like make friends just from what was going on in my head was weird because I feel like I, <laughs> I always struggled to fit in with my peer group because I was just like always had my nose in a book. But the internet introduced me to so many people who were like very similarly equipped in that way I would say so I think like being a remote first firm is very much in our DNA and I love working with founders you know when they're telling me a story I kind of see like the elements of it like a web and I think like little droplets will like start to condense on the web as I'm like oh, okay this trait's really important or like oh, okay this story really shaped this principle and then how do I like roll that up and deliver it th to them in a way where they can take that story wherever they go and use it as a fabric as a piece of the fabric of their company I think that's where I get a lot of my joy and so finding ways to work with our founders to do that and I've actually done it for a lot of our investors as well it's one of my favorite things to do so I think that's very deeply part of our melody and then I think making making connections and surprising in surprising ways like I set my office up like a living room I walked into the venture firm next door and it's like desks in a straight line like padded carpet like super the silence is so loud and you walk into my office and it's like I have like mid-century modern furniture I have my mom's art on the wall I have records I'm like usually blasting house music if I'm doing emails and I think like that level of like rawness and comfortability with myself and how I want to run a venture firm or like live my life really resonates with founders. So I'd say that's kind of like the melody of my firm. I love that melody. That's yeah. a very beautiful cue you have, Paige. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? I feel like we have time for maybe one more question. Were there any questions I didn't ask you that I should have? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the person to suggest you ask me any questions. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it would be wrong if you ask me. What has been your biggest challenge in your fund one? The, the oh, that's a good question. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. So fund one, fund one was a $5 million fund. We made 27 mm -hmm. investments. And I think one of the biggest challenges was like figuring out our story, which is ironic because, you know, that's like my whole shtick. But I think when we started, I was like, okay, I want to... I want to be the change in the venture, venture industry and like I want to invest in underrepresented entrepreneurs and immigrants, people of color and women. And so that was kind of like the thesis that we went out publicly with on our first close. And then as I got further into the fundraising process, it's like, OK, well, I want to create an investment firm based around first principles. And it's like, what are the traits and qualities that I see in people that really resonate with me and so I think that that was one of the challenging aspects is like running experiments or thought processes again and again and again to figure out like what was what was it that really stuck out about the entrepreneurs that we had strong conviction in and I think it took 
you know, it, t- it took us probably doing like 17 or 20 investments to get more clear on like, okay, we need like deep customer empathy and like a strong mission and really and I think like with empathy comes great storytelling ability like if you talk to your customers and you have deep empathy for their problem you're going to be able to relay that problem to customers investors employees and for us that's really important as you think about like scaling a company as a collective fiction and then beyond that having high execution velocity so I think like you know you can have a great idea you can have be a great storyteller but if you can't execute it's really challenging to build a company especially one that's venture scale. And I'll be the first to say, like, I don't think venture is a fit for everyone. It's a treadmill that once you get on, it's very difficult to get off. And it's definitely like a different life than running a lifestyle business. And so I would, yeah, I guess I just like go really deeply into like, do you want to build a venture scale business? Like, are you aware of like what that entails from like a life perspective so I think those are some of the that was like one of the biggest challenges was just like how do we tell the story of what we're doing because founders resonate with it but you know how do you translate that to the outside world thank you for that page yeah I love having these discussions and I'm looking forward to the next one even if it's not a recorded session <laughs> lots of things too. we can share with each other and learn from each other me too thank I you for inviting me today me. Thank you for coming. Special thank you to producer Riley Jennings and podcast editor Tate Doherty for your help on this episode. If you're listening and you'd like to connect to me, follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, page Finn with three N's. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate it. You can look out for new episodes every Monday at 5 p.m. PST. And if you'd like to learn more about the strategies and tactics of seasoned institutional investors and rising venture stars, check out our YouTube channel at Seed to Harvest. Also my TikTok channel, Seed to Harvest, where I post a lot of behind the scenes. Um, And if you like this episode, please rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. If that's on Apple or Spotify. Anyways, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day.